Okay, well, the scripture reading is quite brief um, this morning. Uh, just, um, we say here, five words. Uh, Exodus 20, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. And what we're looking at here is that we are to love God by protecting purity, our own purity, as well as the purity of others. Now, we have seen in this series that um, God has loved us with an infinite and eternal love, with an affection that is so strong and so great that he was willing to give that which he cherished the most, which is his infinitely precious son, that he might save us and that he might have us forever. And really, we, we can't begin to fathom how great God's love is for us. But remember, we saw at the beginning of the series, we do have to believe that God really exists, that there is someone who really, you know, uh, is in heaven. I mean, he's really everywhere, but he is in heaven who cares for us and who had this great love for us that we really were in danger and he really did save us. Unless we believe these things, unless, you know, we, we see the reality of them, we're not going to be able to love him in the way that we should. So we need God to reveal that to us. But you see, this love that the Lord has for us, as we've seen, also calls us to love Him in return. To love Him with the same kind of intensity, the same kind of fervency that we see in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, wherever we deviate from what we see in Christ, that is sin, isn't it? We need to put off all of our sins and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've been examining what it is that Jesus was like, what it is we see in Him. Well, we know that Jesus had the strongest affection for his Father. He didn't love this world. He loved his Father and committed himself to him. He committed himself to his worship uh, in life as well as in the synagogues, to keeping the promises that he had made to him, to be faithful to him. And, of course, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, setting apart his Sabbaths that he might spend the day with him. Again, it's not just the Sabbath hour, remember, it's the, the Sabbath day. God wants us to spend the day with him in worship, in resting, and um, in fellowshipping. And, and again, I would remind you, that is why we have the two services, so we can sanctify this day and honor our Lord. Now, what we see in Jesus is what we also need to be pursuing ourselves. This is how we are to love him, as he did. But Jesus, we know, also loved his neighbor as himself, and that's what we're looking at right now. We saw in the fifth commandment with regard to that, he respected the authority that his father had placed in the family, uh, in the church, in the state, and he honored that authority, which means he gave weight to what it is the authority was saying, because again, he knew that his father had placed that authority in those spheres for his good. So he honored that authority. We saw he protected the well-being of those who were around him. He made sure he didn't do anything that was dangerous for them. His desires, his thoughts, his words were all to, to build people up and to save them. Remember how he stood in front of his disciples when the soldiers came out to arrest him? He wanted to make sure that he protected them. Well, this morning we're going to consider that he also loved his father by keeping the seventh commandment. I don't think any of us here doubt the fact that our Lord Jesus kept that commandment, but he protected also his neighbor's purity, his own as well as, as others. Now, I, I want us to begin by looking at the commandment itself. You shall not commit adultery. Now, on its face, God commands us here to faithfulness, doesn't he, in, in our marriages. Marriage is something we know the Lord instituted for our good. From the creation week, on the same day that he made Adam, Remember how he sent Adam out to name all the animals and he saw that there was a, you know, for every animal that was out there, there was a corresponding, you know, female to every male. And God saw that it wasn't good that he be alone and Adam knew it wasn't good for him to be alone. So he caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and took from his substance, you know, the scripture says from his stuff, you know, from what he was made of, not necessarily a rib. A man doesn't actually have one less rib than women. That was something that I think people believed for a long time. But he took from Adam's nature and he fashioned that substance into a woman that corresponded to him and brought her to Adam 
that they might immediately enter into a marriage covenant, which is, has been, I think, aptly called by Jay Adams, the covenant of companionship. This was God's remedy for Adam's loneliness. And Moses gives us a commentary on this new relationship in Genesis 2, verse 24, when he says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Marriage is the leaving of the headship and the protection of our parents to be joined to our spouse in an, an exclusive relationship. Jesus tells us in Matthew 19, verse 6, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. And this relationship exists for as long as you both shall live. He says, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. When we enter into this covenant, we're making a promise, we're making a covenant with our spouse that we will keep ourselves solely for them and be faithful to them all of our days. Now, if we fail to do this, if, if we have sexual relationships with someone other than our spouse, we break this commandment, okay, we are committing the sin of adultery. Now, that, that's the simplest thing to understand regarding this commandment. But Jesus tells us there's other ways we can break this commandment. He says we also commit this sin if we divorce our spouse and marry another without the grounds of immorality. In this context, I think he is referring to adultery. You know, I just discovered recently, it's kind of odd, but the word adultery is, is applied mainly to, to a man and not to a woman, even though she may commit the same act and it's still adultery. I know the word is used for that, but the word that we usually translate adultery generally applies to men, and so that may be why it says here she commits immorality rather than adultery, okay? So just to understand that I believe adultery is in view here. Uh, if, we, if we put away our spouse for any other grounds other than her infidelity to the covenant, then, and we marry someone else, then we are committing adultery. He says in Matthew 19, verse 9, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality on her part, and marries another woman, commits adultery. So if there is no immorality, you know, that's what the exception here is talking about. If there is no immorality, if there is no adultery on the part of, of, of the woman before the divorce, the thing is the first marriage covenant has not been broken. It's still binding, okay? So if... if and I'm going to use the word we, I hope you don't take this too personally, but I, I'm going to use the word we, I'm going to put us in this situation, okay? So if we put away our spouse, and our spouse hasn't committed adultery, and we enter into a second marriage, then we're committing adultery because the first marriage covenant is still binding, okay? That's the one that we're breaking when we enter into this second relationship, okay? Now, what we don't often think about um, is this, and this, this is debated, okay? This is something that um, you've probably heard other things concerning, certainly Don and I have and the background we come from. But by breaking that first covenant, that covenant is no longer binding. Now, that's what I'm, I'm talking about in the context of somebody who divorces and then remarries, okay? They're no longer bound to that first marriage covenant because it's been broken. They have entered into this second covenant. Now, that's the reason why, if that should happen to us, and God forbid that it should, we shouldn't divorce our second spouse and try to reconcile with the first if they haven't remarried. You know, the Bible actually forbids that in Deuteronomy chapter 24. I would quote it, but it's quite lengthy, but essentially if a man gives his wife a writ of divorce and she goes and becomes another man's wife and that second husband turns against her and divorces her, the first husband may not take her again, okay? So we have explicit commandment ag against that. But the reason is because when they divorced their first wife, entered into the second, they broke that first covenant, they are married to the second spouse and they need to remain married to that second spouse. But even when that one's broken, the reason for their not going back to the first spouse is given because she has been defiled. 
But I think this is an important point because what about those people who have divorced and, and remarried and didn't have biblical grounds and committed adultery? Are they now living in a continuous adultery? You know, there are those who teach that. Uh, Bill Gothard, for one. That person has permanently handicapped themselves spiritually. They may not necessarily have to divorce and reconcile with the first spouse, but they've committed an unforgivable sin, and it's going to go against them for the rest of their lives, so they may yet uh, be saved. But the fact is, they're not living in continual adultery. Okay? It was only the first act of having those sexual relations with someone other than their spouse that was the act of adultery. But the subsequent acts are not a continuing adultery. But let me just think about this, though, for a moment. That doesn't leave us off the hook either, does it? Because if we committed that adultery by, you know, sinning against our first spouse, then we are still adulterers until we repent of that sin and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for his forgiveness. See, those sins still cling to us until we repent of them. It's not because we've stopped doing it that we're, you know, we're, we're now no longer that. We, we need forgiveness, and re forgiveness comes by turning from those sins. Now, here's something else be that I wanted to bring up because of that. The one who was put away may also remarry if their spouse has contracted another marriage, whether they were the guilty of adultery or not, because the first covenant was broken. See, they're no longer bound to that covenant. But again, if they committed the act of adultery, they still remain adulterers until, until they repent, like, like any other sin. Okay, I hope, I hope that's clear. But let's also not forget that, that if the one who commits adultery repents before their spouse divorces them, I do think there can be reconciliation, there can be forgiveness, and I think they ought to seek that. So, you know, that, that's, that's something to, to bear in mind as well. I think the Lord always favors forgiveness and reconciliation whenever possible. Because think about this. How many times have we been unfaithful to the Lord? We're going to consider in just a moment that we are married, not only to our spouses, but we're married to Christ. Have we ever been unfaithful to Him? Have we ever loved something more than Him? Isn't that something we do all the time? And yet, how many times has the Lord received us back to himself? How many times did God, in his relationship with Israel, forgive them and receive them back, even though they were continuously unfaithful to him? Well, Paul tells us there's another way that the marriage covenant can be broken. And uh, divorce can take place, and that, you know, that then free the parties uh, of this marriage, and that is through desertion. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 12 through 15. If any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet... If the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Now, in, in the context of 1 Corinthians 7, this idea of being bound or unbound has to do with being married or unmarried or being bound or, or not bound to a marriage covenant. Paul says, if the unbelieving spouse departs, the believing brother or sister is not under bondage, which means they're no longer bound to the marriage covenant. The reason being, the covenant of companionship has been broken because their spouse has abandoned it, and so they are free to remarry. Now, here's another interesting twist. What if the one who abandons the covenant professes to be a Christian? Okay. Well, then it seems like it, it would be a different matter, but it really isn't because their spouse may also be free if attempts to bring them to repentance and to bring them back to be faithful to that marriage covenant fail, then eventually they're going to be declared an unbeliever by the church, which means it's an unbeliever who departs and it falls into the same category 
as um, Paul is addressing in 1 Corinthians 7. I hope, I hope that's clear. Now, I bring these points up simply to point out that a broken marriage doesn't necessarily mean that a brother or sister, whether they are guilty or not, is bound to a life of celibacy. Okay, there are those who teach that. You know, Don and I went to a college that was steeped in that. I think virtually every professor there believed that there were no grounds for divorce or remarriage. If you tried it once and you failed, even if it was your, your partner's fault and you're the innocent party, some say there is no innocent party, but I think you can be faithful and your spouse can be unfaithful. It, it does happen. That even the innocent one can never remarry because they're still bound to that first person, even if that person has entered into another marriage covenant. Now, I may have used this illustration before, but Don and I went to a church where there was a young man who was engaged to a woman who had been previously married. Her husband was an infidel, and he left, and she very righteously divorced him, and then she got engaged to this nice young Christian man. They, they started going to this church. The pastor said, I will not marry you. I cannot marry you. If you marry, it's a sin. So they broke off the relationship. I mean, she had to essentially watch her, her uh, f future husband-to-be marry another woman within the congregation who had not been previously married, and she herself resolved that she was never going to marry again because of that. And I have to admit, when Don and I were there, I tried to convince the young man that, that the pastor was wrong. From Matthew chapter 19, there's an exception there. The exception is if they commit... Sexual immorality, adultery, those are grounds. It isn't adultery if you remarry under those grounds, but he wouldn't listen. You know, it's interesting, the Puritans, uh, I would say among whom there are no more uh, godly men who were seeking absolute fidelity and purity to God's word. John Owen, I think some of you are familiar, with, you should all be familiar with him by this time. The famous English Puritan of the 17th century wrote even back in the 1600s. And believe me, it was even, this belief was in the church even before that. But he wrote that God never places any of his children in a position where they cannot help but sin. Okay, I hope you see that that's exactly what happens if you tell the innocent party they can never marry again. If your spouse commits unrepentant, unrepentant adultery or they abandon the marriage by desertion, you're not bound to someone who is either married to someone else or who has no intention of returning to the marriage covenant. You see, if God required that, if we were bound and we could not remarry and we didn't have the gift of singleness, by the way, the fact that you're married in the first place kind of you know, speaks to the issue. Do you have the gift of singleness? Well, you don't. That's why you're married. Okay? Well, there'd be no way for us to be able to deal with our desire without sinning. I believe the Bible bears out that what John Owen said on this point is the case. And you know, that's why the exceptions exist. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote what he did regarding desertion, why Jesus spoke about the exception of adultery. Now, the seventh commandment, again, let's get back to the main point. The seventh commandment calls us to be faithful in marriage. I've talked about all the ways we can be unfaithful, but we need to be faithful to our marriage. And Jesus is our example in this area as he is in every other area. Now, it's interesting. It's true that our Lord Jesus had the gift of singleness. We know that in his earthly life, he, he did not get married. Uh, he was perfectly content with that, that he might devote himself completely to his father's work. You know, the apostle Paul did precisely the same thing. And yet, our Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect example to us of being faithful in a marriage, isn't he? Because Jesus did take a bride, and that bride is the church. He gave himself for us so that he might have us forever. And he is the one who loves us and protects us. Paul tells us that he is our model, Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus is the faithful husband who calls us also to be faithful. Okay, now, as I've said, this is what the commandment is all about on the face of it, but we know that it's much broader than that. This um, has a broader application like all the rest of them. And let me just give you uh, a few of them. By the way, I'm sorry this is going so fast. There's so much involved in this commandment. 
but it further prohibits every deviation from God's purpose for making us sexual beings. We need to remember that that really is a gift, isn't it? It's a gift that not only brings pleasure, but it also brings life. It brings procreation. And this commandment is telling us that God wants us to use those gifts in the ways that he has intended us to use them. And the way he intends us to use them is in a marriage between one man and one woman for life with the exception of the things we've already seen. So it excludes everything else. Well, what else is there? Well, just look around, right? It excludes fornication, which is sexual relations outside of marriage. It excludes all forms of homosexuality. Okay, homosexuality is, as we know, is taking all, all different kinds of faces. That's why the, you know, the, whatever the, um, the lettering, you know, that's used to represent that movement continues to expand because there's a new deviation that, that keeps coming up. So transgenderism or whatever it might be. Uh, sexual relations with members of the same sex. That's essentially what all that is. Now, Paul writes this again in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, okay, those having sexual relations outside of marriage. I can't tell you. Even 30 years ago, when, when Donna and I were in Calvary Chapel, how many of the people we knew that were engaged, that were engaging in sexual relations before they got married? Because they're thinking, we're getting married, so what difference does it make? Well, it makes a big difference. Because God says, fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's a sin. Okay, but then he goes on to say, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. Now, it's been pointed out that effeminate and homosexual are simply two different types of homosexuals. The effeminate is the more, let's say you have two men, he's the one that takes more of the woman's role, and the homosexual is the one who takes the more dominant men's role. That's what these two words mean. Okay, those who engage in these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And again, note here, it's not just those, you know, who engage in sexual sin that aren't going to inherit the kingdom. Paul is saying if we practice any sin, we will not inherit the kingdom. We have to repent of all of them, fight against all of them, strive to put on Christ in every area, because that's what Christians do. They love the Lord. And they want to please him in everything. Yes, we slip and fall, but we also get back up and we continue to pursue Christ's likeness. Now, this further prohibits incest, which is sexual relations between those who are too closely related. You'll have to refer to the Old Testament for those relations, but here's one example. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 and 2. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. Well, that's too close of a relationship. You know, we don't know whether the, you know, her husband was still living or not, but it doesn't matter, does it? This is sin. It's not allowed under any circumstances. This was the same sin that John the Baptist was telling Herod that he had committed when he took his brother's wife, okay? His sister-in-law, too close of a relationship, okay, as well as the adultery that was involved. And even though I hate to mention this, I will, this also forbids bestiality, which is relations with an animal, okay? Now, why do I say that? Do you think that's ever going to happen? in this culture? Do you think it hasn't already happened in this culture? The Lord tells us in Leviticus 20, verses 15 and 16, if there is a man who lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death. You shall also kill the animal. If there is a woman who approaches any animal to mate with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. Now, this tells us, if it tells us anything, obviously that is forbidden. It's a serious sin. It's not the only sin that demands death, but, you know, it's one of them that does. It is, it is a perversion of what God has established in the created order. Now, I think we understand that, but this commandment also forbids 
um, those desires that lead to these acts. And I'll just give you the one example again that I've already read from Matthew 5, 27 through 28. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now that, that requires a little bit of explanation. I, I read a quote by Spurgeon saying, just a glance at a woman is, is enough to commit adultery. And that's true, if you understand what he means by that, okay? The word lust means to have a strong desire and that strong desire meaning a desire that leads to sexual relations. What the Lord is not saying here, he doesn't say if you see a woman who has a fair face, she's attractive, that you've committed adultery. Okay? What he's saying is you need to be careful that you don't let that attraction go too far. If it reaches the point where you desire relations or you begin to imagine having an inappropriate relationship with someone other than your spouse, you see, then you've broken this commandment in your heart. Now, that brings up, you know, again, uh, the applications are so broad, right? It brings up another important point. And that is that it's not enough to turn from the act itself, right? We have to turn from the desire for that act. That's what Jesus is addressing in the next two verses in 29 and 30, where he says, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. See, if you don't put that sin to death, that's, Jesus says, this is what's going to happen. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, what does Jesus mean by this? Well, he isn't saying, and, and we know we've, we've heard this for years, he isn't saying we should literally you know, uh, tear out an eye, cut off our hand. Because if we tear out our right eye, we still have our left, right, that we can still look through. If we cut off our right hand, we still have our left, the use of the other. What he means is that we need to cut off the source of these actions. And those come from the heart. We need to kill the desire for these sins in our hearts. If we fail to do that, Jesus tells us we're still guilty of breaking the commandments, okay? Enough, he says, to be condemned apart from faith and repentance. So think about this for a minute. A person who doesn't commit murder, but who wants to murder somebody in his heart, is still a murderer, okay? He still has broken the sixth commandment. The one who doesn't steal but who still covets and wants what somebody else has, even if they don't steal it, is still a thief. And the same is true, Jesus is saying, of adultery, of fornication, of homosexuality, of incest, and bestiality. Okay? We may not be committing these acts, but if we still want to commit these acts, then we're guilty of breaking the commandments. Now, I hope you see where I'm going with this. Okay. Have you heard of the revoice movement within reform circles? The idea that a homosexual can be a Christian in good standing in the church as long as they abstain from the act of homosexuality, but can still embrace the fact that they are a homosexual, okay? That they have this identity and this desire. They don't consummate the desire, but you know, they, they, they hold on to that identity Okay, well, what's, what's the problem with that? It's not enough to abstain from the action. You also have to fight against the desire and put it to death, not embrace it as your identity. Now, they, they would argue, you know, that um, we're, we were born with this desire. God made us this way. This happens to be our particular Achilles heel. Well, maybe it is, okay, but still has to be put to death. We know that every one of us is born with sinful desires. And they may not be the same for each one of us. But the thing that is the same for each one of us is this, that if we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must put on Christ, not only in our actions, but also in our desire. That means we need to put every sinful desire 
desire to death and not identify ourselves with those desires. I mean, if a man has, has difficulty with, with lust, does he identify himself as a fornicating Christian, uh, an adulterous Christian because he has these desires? No, he puts those desires to death and he identifies as a Christian. That's what our Lord calls us to do. Now the question comes, how do we put these desires to death? Well, first of all, don't identify with them, okay? That is not you, okay? That is the old man that has been crucified with Christ. Identify with the new man, okay? And then begin to feed the desires of the new man. Well, we need to, first of all, keep ourselves from being exposed to the things that feed the old man. Again, remember that illustration of the, um, the two, well, the two dogs, you know. Um, if you have two dogs that are going to fight each other, the one that wins is going to be the one that's fed and the strongest. Um, the desire that you feed um, in, your, in your heart is going to be the one that is the strongest. Okay? We need to feed that love for Christ. We need to starve that desire for ungodliness, not expose ourselves to the things that provoke the lust within our hearts, but instead nurture the love we have for Christ by spending time in the Word and in prayer and walking with our Lord Jesus in His paths of righteousness. So again, the commandment is be faithful to, to our marriage covenants. It's broader than that. It tells us that we need to conduct ourselves in the way that the Lord has made things to work. The only legitimate sexual relations are within the bounds of marriage with one's own spouse and all these other things are perversions of what God has created and they're condemned by Him. If one is to enter into the kingdom of heaven, it is a sin that needs to be repented of. But let me just end on this one point. We are not only to protect our own purity, but we also need to protect the purity of others. Certainly our Lord Jesus Christ did that as well. We are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, which means we need to have the same concern for them and their thought life and their desires and their actions as we have for our own. So let, I just say that to say this. We need to make sure that we don't become the cause of tempting anyone else, of provoking impure thoughts in other people by talking about these things, maybe in encouraging them to look at such things or even by things that we may wear, okay? Um, we know the things that, that cause these ideas, these desires, are brought into the gateway of the eyes. We need to be careful to make sure that we promote purity and not immorality. Our response or our responsibility as believers is to help others to do two things. Come to faith in Christ if they don't know Him and to help believers become as much like Him as possible. So. We need to be careful that we don't place a stumbling block in front of anyone, but rather give them every reason to pursue what is good and what is right. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, um, let's ask the Lord to help us to apply these things. I know there was a lot, but remember fidelity to God's established order, fidelity to our marriage covenants, purity of mind and of heart in ourselves and in others. And let's commit ourselves to doing this, particularly as we come to the table there to renew our covenant to follow Jesus, to become more like Jesus, not just in the area of sexual purity, but in every area. Okay. Let's pray.